Okay, so our feature presentation. Um, so do you guys know there's like a primary going on right now? I think there's like elections happening right now, I think, in like five states, is that right? Um, so maybe, I know, one, th yeah, one thread I've noticed in all of this is that like, it seems like every state does it differently. It's like they have different rules for like how that delegates are assigned and all that kind of stuff. Um, so it's, these are the kinds of things that kind of come up every so often when there are elections happening, just how much of a patchwork of the different systems and, and policies and ways of collecting and running elections happen. Every state gets to kind of decide their own rules. And that makes it kind of hard to figure out like, who's on your ballot in a general way. So um, this is something that I've recently become very aware of and appreciated the complexity of. And then we learned that the Center for Technology and Civic Life exists and they are on it. They are like on this problem. <laughs> so you're gonna hear about exactly how they're on it right now with Tiana and Donnie. Thank you. Well, I couldn't have asked for a better introduction. Thank you, Derek, and thank you all for having us. Um, again, I am Tiana Epps Johnson, and I am the founder and executive director of the Center for Technology and Civic Life. I'm going to spend about three minutes giving a high-level overview of what we do at the center and then hand off the rest of the presentation to Donnie, who's going to talk more deeply about the election-specific data that Derek had mentioned um, that's highly relevant to um, this year. Um, so let's get started. CTCL is a nonprofit that's based here in Chicago. We work over in Fulton Market, and our founding team actually moved here to Chicago um, about a year ago from DC. Uh, we started down or up in 1871 um, before moving out to Fulton Market. Um, so it's really nice to be back in this building. Our mission at CTCL is to increase the participation by modernizing engagement between local government and the people they serve. And we decided to found the center because um, there was this really clear trend that the ways that we are connecting with one another and understanding the world around us and consuming information is really technology driven. And local government in particular is really lagging behind when it comes to being able to um, adapt to this changing environment. I'm sure that that is no surprise to anybody here in the room. And one of the things that also is really clear from the work that we're doing is that by and large people who are working in local government are actually really interested and committed to doing a great job. Um, it's not so much of sort of this willful uh, desire to sort of neglect uh, adapting to this change, but instead that oftentimes folks aren't equipped with the skills or the resources to really effectively um, be more confident using technology and uh, more effectively engaging with their community through more modern means. And so um, that's why we founded the center. Right now, uh, our work is particularly focused on the folks who work in local elections um, and also um, helping to provide uh, data around elections. So uh, we do three main things to get towards our mission. The first one is helping folks who are responsible for running local elections. So county election administrators, they might be auditors or recorders. They take lots of different hats, clerks here uh, in Chicago. Um, and we help to network them to share best practices. And we also deliver trainings um, specifically on building skills around technology. Uh, last year was the first year that we rolled out these trainings and we trained around 300 election officials across the country uh, with a particular focus right now on helping officials learn how to um, publish and maintain their own website. Um, that might seem like something that's relatively simple, but one data point that really stuck, sticks out to us is that uh, about a third of the counties in the U.S. Uh, have no uh, basic website with any voting information. So that means that for uh, you know, those 966 counties, there's no place where someone can go online and find out what their polling place is or who are the representatives, uh, their representatives are, or who is on their ballot. Um, really sort of basic things that you need to navigate the process. And that wouldn't be a huge deal if it wasn't for federalism, uh, which means that all, you know, there's not really a state level place where this information is aggregated to. So really the only way that you can find this information is if your local election official has it. 
related to that, um, the other big thing that we do is uh, gather and organize the nation's ballot and elected official data. Uh, we've been doing this since 2012 with uh, candidate data, so what's on your ballot, uh, and 2013 with elected official data, which is sort of a natural data set that dovetails off of candidates on the ballot. This information has been accessed over 60 million times, uh, primarily through a key partnership that we have with Google, um, where we make this information free and open avail openly available to anyone to use through the Google Civic Information API. Um, so I'm going to hand it over to Donnie now, who's going to talk more in depth about that, those data sets and how y'all might be able to use them this cycle to both connect with the information for yourself and also to maybe build some tools on top of it. <coughs> Well, Tiana didn't tell me that her little thing moved, so you don't see like my arm going up and down. I promise this is a very animated talk I gave about sustainable civic data. Um, my name is Donnie Bridges. I am the co-founder director of civic data uh, here at the Center for Technology and Civic Life. Um, and I have a constant problem. So what I do for most of my day is figure out the answer to these two questions, right? What's on my ballot? Who represents me for across the country? My problem is that the reaction that I usually get when I talk to my friends is, so what? Like, this is a problem that should be solved, right? You just go on the internet, it's 2016, and you get the answers to these very, very simple questions about democracy. So the first thing I want to do for you all here is like justify my existence for a second, uh, which I've been trying to do for about 31 years now. Hopefully, I'll have better success tonight. <laughs> so. Let's talk federalism. Tiana mentioned this. There are almost 8,000 places, 8,000 offices in the United States that are in charge of elections, like full stop. That means that if you are trying to find out something about your personal election, like you have a one in 8,000 chance of like spinning the wheel and getting to it. Uh, but it gets even worse, right? Because as Tiana mentioned, a third of these places don't have any information about elections online. So we have a giant disaggregated set of people with giant disaggregated sets of rules trying to put together information about the same thing, right? Who's on my ballot? Who represents me? So it shouldn't be a surprise to you that this information, and any civic information really, uh, if uh, the folks on our other side who work on creating websites that are nice and pretty and create data very well, come out uh, with information that is dubiously machine readable. <laughs> Not exactly GIS. <laughs> and of course, very low bandwidth. These are real live millennials interacting with snail mail. This will be in the Met one day. Um, but this is, this is the way this information lives, right? If you are a local election official in a rural county, Maybe you don't have a website. Maybe you only have, you only have two people in your office. And all you guys are really caught up to so far is email. You'd love to have a website, but you don't have the budget for it. So th put this information wouldn't live online. So the fastest way for you to get a ballot from your office to me in Chicago, or even one of your constituents in your county, is by sending a piece of physical mail, a sample ballot which is all well and good if you're you know, three weeks out and you remember where you put your sample ballot, but if it's the night before an election and you're like, oh shit, there's an election, as I'm sure nobody in here has ever done, <laughs> that's not a lot of help to you. So that's why we decided that we were gonna start these projects to just put at the very least the most basic information out there in one place so that voters and people who wanted to interact with the government could go and find this in the places they're already looking for, but and also so that people like you in this room, the people who build things, the people who build tools, that like drive civic change, don't have to go and do all of this terror work yourself. Like we, we take the faxes so you don't have to. Uh, okay, well, brief aside, I promise you about the fax machine. All right, there is only one piece of equipment that if you like took away from me, I would not be able to do my job. And it is like the e-fax number that I have to my email box. But this year, what we're gonna do is we're gonna get a physical fax machine, and Tiana, I haven't told you about this, but this is a materials, equipment, and resources request. <laughs> a physical fax machine that is going to dump all of the physical faxes into a giant trash bin. At the end of the election, I'm gonna have a bonfire. Uh, <laughs> you are all invited. We're gonna do it somewhere where it's hopefully legal. <laughs> so, about the data sets we collect from these folks. The first one is called the Governance Project. Uh, this is a data set of elected officials and contact information for those elected officials that is nationwide, goes down to at least the county level and it goes to the city level for every city that is above 130,000 people in population. It used to go to any city that was bigger than Stockton, California, but we finally got Stockton, California. You're welcome, anybody who's listening from Stockton. Um, 
This also includes information on uh, websites, information on Facebook pro pages, information on Twitter handles. So just a one-stop shop for places for where you can go to put in your address and say, who are all the elected officials that represent me? Very similarly, the Ballot Information Project does this for candidate data. Uh, previously, we've gone down all the way to the county level. Uh, this year, we're going down all the way down to your mosquito control boards, your tuberculosis districts, your airplane control, your hyacinth control districts, which is Lee County, Florida. You gotta control your hyacinths. Uh, those are all real elected officials, by the way. Um, <laughs> and we put together some basic information, including like, you know, who is going to be on your specific ballot. So we tie all of this information to political geography, and we're gonna uh, do a little quick demo on how we do that uh, in a second. Uh, and then we also give you, again, sort of just basic contextual information. Uh, what is like, what is the website you can go to to learn more about uh, if I have a Facebook pro profile, anything like that. Um, that is going to be available for the 2016 general election, uh, and it's going to be mostly through the Google Civic Information API, which I'm going to talk about in a second. But all of these data sets are completely standardized. We take all of the different 8,000 formats that this comes in, put it into one format, put consistent headers on it, uh, make sure it's as comprehensive as possible, make sure it's as local as possible, uh, make it individualized to a voter's address, and we make it available for free. And one of the ways we make it available for free for everybody is the Google Civic Information API, which we are going to live demo right now, because what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> Um, so this is the Google Civic Information API's reference page. Uh, I can use a computer, I promise. Ooh, reversed. Uh, this is just a place where you can like put in uh, a demo query. Uh, I encourage you guys to go to this place. I'll put the link in the uh, uh, Google Doc. Uh, so you put an address here. This is actually my address, but it's my address until Saturday, so you can't come and get me for too long. Um, and this is a representative by address query. So we're gonna say include offices. This is saying, don't just get me the districts that I live in, get me the people who actually uh, hold these offices. And it'll send this API request, and it'll bring you back all of this data. And so it starts out with divisions. This is taking my address and saying, okay, what uh, electoral districts do you live in? Because think about like all of the different levels of government. Each of those levels of government represents a certain district, right? Like the governor represents the state of Illinois. The president represents the United States. Your state legislator represents your state legislative district and your city. And all of these things get slapped on top of each other and have nothing to do with each other. The city doesn't talk to the county. The county doesn't talk to state ledge. The state ledge doesn't talk to Congress. So figuring all of that out is like the first base layer to getting what your individualized information is. And so we do this by uh, matching to a voter file. Uh, so who's familiar with a voter file? If you're not familiar with a voter file, uh, a voter file is, is basically the listing of all uh, people who are registered voters in a state. Uh, and it, it is what is used at like the polling place you go to to identify like are you in the right polling place? What are the like things that you need to vote for? Um, and so we will match your address and create districts out of that. Uh, and if your address matches, we can say, okay, 1649 West Cortland is in Chicago City Council Ward 32. It's in Illinois 15. And it, we grab all of those districts back for you. Um, I know there are probably some GIS questions going to ask about shapefiles. We'll get to that later in Q&A. Um, but all of this comes in, gets back an o OCD identifier. It's Open Civic Data Identifier, uh, which is a set of just standardized names for these places uh, and these buckets of electoral district uh, that allow uh, the data that we have in this uh, API to be used uh, with all sorts of other different data sets that exist uh, across the civic tech space. So, but in addition to just the divisions, obviously, we have the offices, obviously a president represents me, I get a representative, I get a state house district, uh, I get a lieutenant governor, all of that good stuff. And it also pulls me back the officials. So I can send some mail to Barack Obama, uh, just like a hey to Mark <laughs> Curt. Uh, he still hasn't returned my Christmas card. Uh, Bruce Rauner has, though. Uh, you can go say hi to Rom. All of this information is the stuff that you can get put back. All of this is just always going to be constantly free uh, and available for you to build stuff on top of. Uh, and this is going to be a very similar thing for uh, what it's going to look like for uh, what's going to be on your ballot. Speaking of, great. Um, 
one of the cool things that we do is, is we don't do any front end with this. We just all, we do the data and leave it alone. We are not good at front end. Uh, and the way we figure it, there are a lot of people out there who are really good at building front ends, and we would rather them have all of the time in the world to think about building a front end to this and not have to worry about any of the data stuff. So we do all of the crap so everybody else can build the cool, sexy apps to get all the funding. Um, not that I'm bitter. Uh, <laughs> So this can be anything from voter-facing tools, like this is some of the stuff that's uh, happened through Google, uh, but it's not all, it doesn't all have to be nationwide, right? Like, uh, we're gonna be working with ballot ready this cycle, we've done previous work with the League of Young Voters and civic engagement groups like that who wanna do it at a smaller scale. We wanna open this up so that it has the most impact for everybody. If you wanna take just a slice of this data and use it, please, please do. Um, but in addition to this, one of the cool things, and one of the things that I'm excited to talk to the folks in this room about, uh, and hopefully hear some ideas, uh, is, sort of research and advocacy this data can be used for. Because this data set doesn't, hasn't previously really existed at this scale. And what we found is that there's a lot of like, ways to dig into this data that people haven't had an opportunity to do before. So this is uh, a couple of visuals from a project we worked on with uh, the Women Donors Network uh, called the Reflective Democracy Campaign. And so they said, okay, well we know all of these elected officials, we know all of these candidates, like who are they? Uh, and so we did some surveying, uh, we matched it up to uh, an augmented voter file, and we pulled race and gender for these elected officials uh, and these candidates. Spoiler alert, white dudes! <laughs> uh, to the tune of 90% of elected officials being white, 95% of elected prosecutors being white, uh, and 90% of candidates being white. Um, I can actually show a, a video. Yeah, a video, why not? Everybody likes videos. Oh, everybody likes silent movies, right? Yeah. Look like. Let's zoom out from the people we see in the media and the people we talk to every day. That's Taylor and look Swift. at the big picture. <laughs> About 314 million of us live in the United States. 51% of us are women. And 49% of us are men. 63% of us are white. 37% of us are people of color. Our country is changing fast. But are the people who represent us from city council to Congress, keeping up with that change. Do we live in a reflective democracy? We did some research, and here's what we found. We studied 42,000 elected officials who represent us, from the county level all the way up to Congress. If they reflected America's population, our elected officials should look like this. But it actually looks like this. 71% of elected officials are men. 90% are white, and 65% are white men. That means men have three times as much power as women, and white Americans also have three times as much power as people of color, and white men have eight times as much power as women of color. When 31% of the population controls 65% of elected offices, is it a surprise that most Americans feel our democracy is broken? To learn more about the data we've collected, visit us at Who Leads Us and share the data with your friends. Then tell us at Who Leads Us how you think we can become a more reflective democracy. Yeah, so we thought that was pretty cool. I mean, the like ability to do the research, not the results. The results are terrible. Um, <laughs> so yeah, um, that's about all I got. So I'm going to close. I, I used to be an organizer, so I can't leave you without an ask. Uh, the first is take our data, please. We would love uh, everyone to play around with their data, find some use for it if it's possible. Uh, if there's anything uh, that is missing or anything that's weird, please feel to reach out to us. Um, but also just tell us what you need. Uh, we want to make sure that the data sets we're collecting are as useful to the folks that are in this room. Uh, you guys are our, our tar target audience. Uh, so we want to make sure we're being responsive to, to y'all's needs. And if there's anything that we can go and make some phone calls and light some faxes on fire uh, so you guys don't have to, let us know. So that was that. Is it all a batch or is there a batch files to download? Um, so we do do some batch files. We recommend doing the API just because that's what allows us to update everything in one place as opposed to all the places, especially for the elected official information, because we keep that constantly updated because elected officials keep dying and getting indicted. Also, like elections. How hard is it when uh, districts get redistricted? 
so hard and not as hard as you think. Um, what's great about the o OCD IDs, the Open Civic Data Identifiers, is that those are mostly durable, right? Because they're just like empty vessels that get contained uh, in a voter file. So if it all gets changed at the voter file level, like if all of the ones become like half ones and half twos, as long as we're calling it the same thing, one can always match to one. So that's not as big of a difficulty uh, if it can be uh, shunted off to the people who are at the Twitter file level. The real problems come when we don't know that those shifts happen uh, because it's easy enough to get when Congress shifts because they're you know every ten years. But precincts, for instance, like the places of the sort of like atoms of voting, uh, city council districts, those sorts of things can shift at pretty much random. Uh, and if you don't know that they're shifting, you don't know to make the adjustments you need to. Um, and so it's a constant battle. It's, it's just sort of the, the story of a lot of our uh, uh, sort of scale issues. It's a constant battle just trying to keep up with information that you wouldn't otherwise know to look for. Like you don't know to look for a random bumble fuck city, bumble, <laughs> bumble <laughs> ton. <laughs> <laughs> City uh, Council District 1 uh, getting transformed because there was a lawsuit or anything like that. Um, and so we try to manage that in the same way we manage like elected officials by a very, very robust network of Google alerts and searches uh, and constant vigilance. In the training that you've done so far with local officials, is there um, a, com like a prevailing common challenge or a best practice that, that you like to talk about? That's a I'm going to introduce you to Whitney May and Chris Samsel who will answer you this question. Um, regarding data, regarding public information in general? Mm. Either. I think our main focus with the election officials that we work with is making sure that the information they public is publishes is written in plain language. Because mm -hmm. I think a lot of times, um, and I've done this before, I've worked in local government, um, sort of CYA is you just take a code and, or a general statute, you copy and paste it, uh, and that way you're safe. Uh, so moving them away from that and sort of unpacking that language and writing it in a way that anyone can understand. Yeah, like just even the, the thought of having people like having election officials step into the shoes of a voter and like do some sort of actual user centric design is like. <laughs> For, and it's awesome to see. Uh, and I'm just really jealous I don't get to work on more of those projects with these folks. So. Yeah, has anyone used your data yet to create a, uh, a, a geographic uh, uh, interactive with layers of uh, elected districts you know, stacked on top of one another? So if I click, clicked into a zip code in Illinois, I could look at all of the districts for that particular zip code? So at the, that has existed in sort of smaller batches. I know the Tribune has done that not with our data, uh, but with the city of Chicago. There have been some efforts that Google has put around that, but I don't think anybody's just done that as far as I know. So people should do that. Eric. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the voter file data and where you get it from, and if there's any sort of push to make that information more available to Sure, yeah, so voter files are super weird. Um, vo voter files are maintained by the state for the most part. Um, there are some places where they're maintained by the county and counties will have different sets of information. The, the, the general rule in elections is everything differs state by state. Um, but it, voter files especially, there are some states like North Carolina uh, and Ohio where like, it is free to download a voter file. You can just go to a URL and you can get everybody's, we almost made it. Uh, you can, <laughs> um, and you can just like download these CSVs of all of these voters. Uh, and then there are places like Arizona where it costs tens of thousands of dollars to get the same set of information. And so the way we do it is we work with a national voter file vendor. Our vendor is called Target Smart, uh, and they do a lot of the back end collection of these voter files and maintenance of these voter files. Uh, and they also do the work of standardizing fields across voter files, which is also very valuable to us. Um, but it is not a free process. It is not a cheap process, and it is a process that is like woefully esoteric for people who don't come from a campaign's world to sort of get into. Um, so I don't know, honestly, if there is uh, a movement about getting 
uh, more open source voter files. Um, I know that voter files are one of those tricky things because they have lots of personal identifiable information about people who may not know that they have lots of personally identifiable information just out there on the web. Like I doubt that a lot of people in Ohio know that I can go like figure out where they live and the last seven times they were in the polling place like in two seconds. Um, and so there's like not a huge like, th there's like a public squick factor that goes into it, but I think it's definitely something because it's a very, very useful tool, um, both like for uh, just purely finding out geographies to doing uh, in, like experiments and research into vote histories and things yeah. like that. I, as you might imagine, the data in a voter file is particularly valuable to people running for office. And so the biggest effort to sort of democratize voter files and make them more accessible to candidates that might not have the money to otherwise do that um, is through the Nation Builder software. Mm. Yeah, Nation Builder wants to have the free vote. Um, can you do this sort of stuff for school districts? So school districts, yes and no. We're going to hopefully by the end of November have a much better handle on school districts um, because school districts, as I'm sure you're aware, uh, in some places are nicely delineated and in some places like the state of Arizona has like 15 counties and somehow like 2,000 elected school districts. Um, so we are working on building that up right now, but right now we're, fo we're trying to focus on just the core sort of like uh, constitutional and legislative districts. Um, we do have some judicial districts that are going to be getting loaded in very soon. Um, and like I said, we're also trying to get uh, more special districts. Would that be only school districts with elected school boards? Or so pro at least in the first batch, I would imagine we would be focusing on the folks that would have elected school boards because a primary use case for this data is then displaying who would be running for the school board office, who would be elected school board. Um, I don't know. If the information sort of lived in the same place for, as an elected school board versus a non-elected school board, we would load both in, but we wouldn't sort of go out of our way to hunt down the elected school board, if that makes sense. Um, what's your relationship with the Google developer API? I mean, that, that calls your services so the, the, Google services too? So yeah, there, there are a bunch of different uh, data providers uh, that go into these APIs, obviously, because uh, there's a lot of information that they want to service. Um, and so we are one of the main providers in terms of like baseline information. That information gets supplemented and swooped around in a lot of different ways. One of the big relationships we have for uh, the election day uh, tools is we work closely with the voting information project, which does is a, a project of the Pew Center on the states that primarily focuses on getting official data around polling places uh, and where people go to vote. And so, in the like on election day, you will see where do you go vote and who's on your ballot next to each other, uh, and that's sort of two pieces of data from two different sources getting zipped together. Um, and so th that happens a lot, and we're really happy when it does, because it means our data is interoperable, and we would like people to use our data for everything. Uh, so. Uh, in terms of uh, blockades from like a state policy perspective, mm -hmm. or not even just blockades, mm -hmm. if you want to look at a state for a model mm -hmm. for how you can best access that data and turn it into like accessible data mm -hmm. that let a thousand flowers bloom and let everybody pack away and create good models. Is there anywhere you can point to where there's good legislation or policy that allows that to happen? I don't know about legislation and policy, but I would imagine North Carolina has recently just like really impressed me. Um, they just, uh, there is a like FTP site where you can download everything you could ever possibly want uh, in, uh, about North Carolina elections. Um, large data sets, I mean, you can look at you, you can independently validate the analysis that they are doing on uh, voters that they are likely to not have identification uh, that they would like our targets to like push that ID so they can get to the polls. Um, and it's something that's relatively new that they're working on. Um, but in terms of just like letting it all hang out, uh, is, North Carolina has been very oppressive. Uh, for right now, I'm not going to shame any states. At the more local level, um, Maricopa County, Arizona, is sort of a pioneer about having data uh, open, which is interesting because they're, that's where Phoenix is, and they were just in the news for sort of things that feel like they're on the opposite side. But um, they were, uh, multi like decades ago now, the first place to ever have online voter registration. And they um, actually have shape files for their district, which is something that's really unique um, at the election, in the election space um, so they are uh, an interesting local model for being able to access information. Uh, do you make the precinct boundary data mm -hmm. that you sort of make from the voter file public? Mm -hmm. 
So we don't make the boundaries public because that's ba it was it's basically a creation of all the addresses and that would just be republishing like the voter file. Um, you probably could work your way around that. Um, but the other, the other thing about especially things like precincts uh, are that they are so finely tuned and finely grained. Like there are precincts that run across apartment buildings, essentially. Like, like it's very, very common if you're on the odd side of a street versus an even side of the street, you're in different precincts. So when you start trying to like fuzzy match those sort of precincts, then you end up with like so many edge cases that everybody essentially becomes an edge case. New York has some places where different floors. Yes. <laughs> yes, if I have one ask for the group, please, if you use our data or anyone else's data, <laughs> Um, just don't build a tool that only searches for information using a zip code because that will get you all of the wrong information because zip codes do not say anything about electoral districts and it's a common sort of first misstep when folks are wanting to b build really awesome things. Uh, it seems like a logical way to be able to associate people with the information that you'd want to connect them with. Um, and so that is, that'd be my one ask for the group in addition to use our data. <laughs> if you have a logical thought, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> single greatest thing you did to democratize things. Candidates, the only thing holding some parties together here in Cook County, uh, the endorsement of the Democratic Party means nothing except one thing. They control the voter file. Um, it controls candidates. Uh, there's a, just a handful of vendors across the country. They control the industry. They make tons and tons of money. There are very few places where voter, voter files exist outside of the party infrastructure. And the party infrastructure, both parties, hold over the heads of candidates. If you really want, if you want to get a lot more candidates, you want to open things up, have a national vote file. So I, I, I will say a couple things on that. One, I really enjoy the color of your shirt. Uh, <laughs> Two, I, I think that you're right, and I think that, as Tiana mentioned, Nation Builder is, is sort of going towards that model of trying to make it as open as possible. But there, I, I think that one of the big things, especially if we're talking about party infrastructure, and this, this is me taking off my 501c3 hat uh, and not speaking as an organization, but speaking as an individual who's unrelated to the person sitting over there. Um, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> is that a lot, a lot of the, the ad value on that comes from things like the voter activation network and, and the, these tools that are built on top of it are not just built on the voter file itself. Like the voter, the Ohio, Ohio, Ohio voter file itself isn't gonna really help you except like it'll show you who your fours are um, or the people who voted in the last four elections. But I, I think that there is like utility that can be made on top of that. Your point is well taken. Uh, and if, they, if everybody made their voter files more open, then I would know where everybody's electoral districts were, and I could sleep a lot better night in October. Last question. Uh, are you primarily targeting the, the current state of the world, or are you also supporting the historical periods of how things used to be? So we are currently start, we are currently focused on current reality. But as we have more and more past reality in our existence, we are also maintaining that past reality. <laughs> um, which is to say, we're not going out right now and getting historic like state legislative candidate data. Uh, it's something we've talked about in the past. But as we move forward, we're able to do, like we're starting to be able to do longitudinal analysis on candidates from 2012 and 2014 and 2016 uh, and things like race and gender and things like that. So stay tuned. But could you use that data model if you wanted to create this? <coughs> you absolutely could. And then you could use a tool called DDoop to match all the identifiers up. <laughs> have, you done, have you done any uh, cross analysis with uh, financial uh, finances and uh, so that, that is something that is hopefully forthcoming very soon. Uh, one of the big problems, or one of the big challenges, is that as we are creating this set of information, uh, campaign finance folks are getting their set of information from campaign finance databases, which are completely separate, because of course they are. Why would they be related in any way? Um, and those are, of course, like maintained in different plays in different places. Uh, and so there hasn't been, and because we, we need this data at sort of different times, since campaign finance data is often relevant much earlier than sort of like who's on your ballot information, uh, it's, there hasn't been a lot of like mushing together yet. Um, and so right now, I think one of the things that we're gonna be hopefully doing uh, this cycle is trying to like make the mushing easier. Stay tuned in this space. <laughs> uh, well, awesome. Thank you again. Everybody.